So hello and welcome back to Strathpever Junction. Uh, in today's video I'm going to take a, a brief look at uh, Helgen's wonderful um, class of 5 shunter uh, and then towards the end of the video I'm going to install the 6 pin chip in it um, so that it's good to go on my DCC layout. So if that's something you're interested in stick around, if it's not well there's plenty of other videos now on my channel to have a look at so hopefully you'll find something that's of interest to you. But anyway let's get uh, straight into the overview of the shunter itself. Okay, so firstly we'll have a just a very brief dip into some of the history of the, the shunter. It's a class 05 shunter and it's a, an 060 uh, diesel mechanical shunter and what that means is that you know, rather than it being a diesel electric like a lot of the, the big locomotives um, where the diesel engine generates electricity which is then passed through to the wheels to turn the wheels um, this has a diesel engine which directly itself drives the wheels so that's a fairly key distinction um, they were quite popular uh, shunters in their day um, but they did get phased out fairly early as uh, shunters with, with British Rail are concerned and um, it was built by Hunslet Engine Company um, and between about 1955 and, and 1961 I think from, from memory um, and they were mainly used in the, the eastern and the Scottish regions of, of the BR network um, so, you know, I'm up in Scotland, my layout's based in Scotland. I don't think they ever got up to Inverness um, or Strathpeffer, um, but certainly they were, they were a feature of the railways up here and a, a feature of the railways way down south as well. Now, um, there was a, another shunter that was, uh, or has been erroneously given the 05 uh, class, tops class, uh, which was an Andrew Barclay built one, but uh, that seems to have been a mistake, but it does pop up, so... Uh, now and again. So when I was doing research for this video it was something that uh, I did mention. But just to clarify, this is the 050 and no others. Now most of these locomotives um, were actually were drawn fairly early and were replaced by the fairly common 03 and 04 locomotives. Um, and I've got one of each uh, amongst my fleet because uh, I'm a bit of a, well my vice in model railways other than class 37s is probably shunters. So I've got one of most of the shunters uh, in, in my fleet. Um, but one of them was uh, transferred from the mainland uh, uh, rather than being withdrawn uh, to the Isle of Wight uh, and uh, for many years uh, was was used by Isle of Wight uh, Railway uh, for, for moving rolling stock around and so on. So it was, a, it was definitely a feature there for quite some time after it had been withdrawn or replaced on mainland BR. Um, now I think there's about four that have been, um, been preserved so there's not that many about but uh, there, there are a handful and one of them I think is that the, the Ribble, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the Ribble Steam Railway and um, they, they have, uh, they have a, a lovely one actually that, actually that does quite a lot of uh, passenger tours and so on on their railways so they can still be seen today by anyone who's an enthusiast. Now one thing that I would mention is um, I'm a bit of a sucker for BR Blue. It's definitely one of my favourite liveries. So I make sure that wherever uh, possible I have a, a locomotive in that colour if I can afford it, if the right one comes up and so on. Now I have this in BR Blue and I think it looks absolutely excellent in BR Blue. But if I'm being totally true to prototypical form, um, there wasn't a BR Blue Class 05 that looked like this. Um, all of the ones that uh, were operated by BR um, on the mainland um, were a, a BR Green or BR Green variant. Um, when that single loco was shipped over to the Isle of Wight for use in the railway there, um, it did end up in a sort of BR Blue livery, but it wasn't exactly the same as this. And this one is actually as preserved on the Ribble Steam Railway. So it's a sort of fictitious livery, um, if you like. Uh, there was, as I say, the one on the Isle of Wight that was a little bit like this, but it wasn't detailed in exactly the same way. So it is sort of fictitious, but I'm not a total rivet counter. I, I go with what I like, um, and uh, I like this, so that's that's why I got it. Okay, so we'll take a little bit of a look at the actual detailing of the loco now before moving on to, to other things later in the video. The first thing I would say is that um, as is normally the case with Helgen models, it looks really beautiful, it's been really well done. They seem to have an art for detailing that I'm not sure all of the other manufacturers quite, uh, quite hit. Um, but maybe I'm biased, maybe I particularly like them, I don't know, but it's a, it really is a lovely model. Um, the the moldy detailing is fairly simple, but it's certainly good enough for what we need, but they applied or individually applied details of handrails, there's a wee filler cap there picked out in bronze, uh, there's lamp irons, there's the, the hose uh, details, even on the, the, the buffer beam details here, um, you can see the, uh, the kind of non-slip plate 
uh, that you often find uh, on, on locomotives um, for people clambering over the bodywork. That's That's been picked out. Lovely sprung buffers as well, a good thickness to them, they don't look particularly plasticky. Um, there's handrails on the steps there, the uh, the actual wheel sets themselves and the conrods and other things, it's all it's all beautiful. Um, uh, and coming along the side here as well, the, the livery details, okay it's a fairly plain livery, livery but they're applied really beautifully, really crisply. The, the wasp stripes themselves, there's not any sort of blurred edges as you sometimes find. Um, but I think the, the piece de resistance in terms of detailing this model has got to be in the cab itself. Uh, the cab interior has been done really well. Whereas in many models when you peer in, uh, there's nothing in the cab or there's very limited molded detail. Uh, they've done a really lovely job in here picking out controls and dials and, and conduit and other things. Um, if you wanted to supplement that and augment it, you could probably put a few dabs of different coloured paint on to maybe better pick out handles and dials and things, but really it's beautiful. The glazing has been done really nicely too with um, with silver glazing bars applied to the outside, but really thin, so it's a, a decent prototypical look and it's believable. Um, it's it, it really is just a beautiful, a beautiful model. Windscreen wipers as well, brake handles inside, seats. It's crying out this one for a, a, a driver. So uh, once I found a driver and perhaps a sort of shunter's mate, uh, I'll definitely pop it inside. But yeah, really in terms of detailing, it's a really beautiful model. As I, as I mentioned there, the, the front of it is really nicely done. Uh, the radiator grills have individual elements there just uh, um, below the, the really nicely picked out uh, Hunslet uh, logo itself, or well, not so, lo not so much logo, but just text. And then you have the, the kind of wire um, conduit as well for the, for the lamps. Um, another nice thing that you often get in a halogen is the, uh, the, the actual, um, what do you call it? It's late at night here. <laughs> um, the, the couplings um, are often really nicely picked out as well. So that's a, another lovely detail. Um, and again, from the, from the other camera angle there, just along the side, nicely moulded detail uh, in the various hatches uh, to get into the bodywork itself. Now, I'll see if I can uh, get this closer so you can actually have a look in the cab. I don't know how well it's going to come out, but we'll, we'll give it a shot anyway and see how we get on. Um, but that cab detail in there, really nicely done. You can see the on the sort of bulkhead here, we've got the various details picked out. Um, we've got uh, a couple of chairs in there as well for the, the, the drivers to sit on uh, and his mate and uh, little slots and gear sticks there. So yeah, really, really nicely done. Now one thing that's often um, omitted on uh, models, particularly diesels actually, is underframe detail. Uh, and there isn't a huge amount of underframe detail on this. But one of the things that I do really like is the, I think they're counterweights, I'm not entirely sure what you call them, but certainly the, the, the kind of weights here that come off the, the, the drivetrain and, and turn the wheels there. Um, nicely picked out in red, really crisply done, but also there's a nice shape and detail to them as well. We've got the sanding pipes as well. Uh, along the side there, and various other details. And actually, the wheels on these are really nicely done as well, which is quite a surprise. Uh, some of them are very basic, but um, we'll see how well how this will come out here, how well. Um, but you've got the, the spoked wheels, but uh, they've been done really nicely, and you've got the sort of black spokes and the, the silver rims and tires, I guess, there. And then the conrods are nice, sort of slim conrods as well. Um, so sometimes, for example, on the uh, the Bachmann Class 08, the Conrods are a little bit big, I think, whereas the Hornby ones are, are a much better scale. But on these ones, on this Helgen, it's, it's really pretty nice. So yeah, all in all, it is lovely, uh, fine detail. And uh, one of the things, actually, that it does mention on the box, now I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to delve into the box too much because we've all seen millions of these boxes, but it does specifically say on this one, care is required when unpacking and handling this model due to the small detail parts. And that's certainly, certainly very true with this one. Um, I think you often see on eBay and other sites, uh, if people are selling these small, uh, small shunters that they have broken handrails and things just from general handling. And with this one, um, there's definitely potential here to break some of the lovely detailing. So easiest way to pick up really is just by holding it in the middle there. Uh, and uh, at the side of the body. That's probably the easiest way on this one. But anyway, um, that's just a quick overview of, of the model itself. It's a beautiful model, really happy to have it in the collection. However, I run everything on DCC, so I'm going to add a chip to this. Now, this one is a six pin chip. 
Um, and actually, I think I've only got one or two models with six pin chips. Um, they're generally pretty straightforward to install unless you want to use them for lighting um, when they don't actually have a common blue, um, a, a common positive blue. So you have to uh, use a couple of diodes uh, and take a feed off the, the track feeds to make that return leg or out leg, so it's positive, I guess, uh, to the decoder. But um, this doesn't have any lights. I am thinking about maybe adding a cab light, but I'm not going to do that today. So for now, it is just a simple case of sticking in the decoder for movement. So that's what we'll do now. We'll get the servicing cradle out, I'll get a few tools and uh, we'll get into it. So I've got the servicing cradle here and uh, I do have the instructions on standby. Um, sometimes with these wee ones they can be a little bit fiddly to get into and uh, this one certainly looks like it has the potential to be a bit of fun. Um, the cap has to come off first, then there's two screws and let's just refresh my memory. Um, and once you've got those two screws, you should then be able to remove the body to gain access. But um, as anyone who has watched my videos in the past on installing things, it probably knows that uh, it's not always as straightforward as instructions make out. And sometimes if I have said this next bit should be fairly easy, I then get stuck in half an hour of uh, blue air and try my very best to get things apart without breaking them. But anyway, the cab. Um, what it says is that the cab should just lift off. Now, I have done a little preliminary uh, wiggle and it doesn't seem like it's just going to lift off uh, without any, any issues. Um, the one thing that I would mention is I have looked underneath here and there's a few little tabs here. Um, and uh, if you push these tabs down, there we go, the body pops off slightly. In fact, I'm just going to change this for a, a flat head screwdriver. I'll be back in just a second. Okay, I'm back with a trusty flat-headed screwdriver uh, to hand. So I'm just going to press in these little tabs. Um, I don't know how well they'll show. Let's, let's just bring it over to the camera there and see if we can get it. There's a, a little tab here and there's one on the other side as well. So I'm just going to pop, pop the screwdriver into that tab and push down. Yep, that's moved. We'll do the same on the other side. That's moved. Now the cab is starting to separate from the, the body here. There's other another two tabs quite similar in form, just right at the back of the buffer beam here, hidden from view, and another on the other side. So I'm just going to push that as well. Yep, that's gone in. And then it's just there. There is actually a little, I don't know if you can see it here. Um, there is a, a little tube pipe here, which I suspect, yeah, it's to do with the braking system. So do be careful when you're pressing in this last tab here. Um, as I suspect, you could break the pipe if you're not careful. So we'll just pop that in. Excellent. So that feels to me like the cab should, yeah, there we go. Let's gently, does it? There we go, excellent. Now, um, the cab on the 08 shunter is actually pretty hard to get off, <laughs> but uh, this one really came off pretty easily. So good, good one, Helgen. It uh, holds itself on fine, but comes off fairly easily too. So we'll just pop that to one side um, and uh, we'll turn it over. Um, but just before I do actually, we can have a look there at a bit of the, the actual cab detail as well. The, the seats are really, the seats are detailed as well. That kind of comfy, fake plastic kind of stuff that used to get in the in the 70s and 80s. Um, but really nicely detailed. And here's the brake handle here. It's very delicate, all this stuff. So, so do be careful, but nicely detailed. Anyway, so we turn it over and uh, looking for the two screws. Um, as far as I can see, I think it's probably the two screws here at the front, not the two screws here, which just, I think, cover the, the cogs and the mechanism under there. So I'll just double check with the instructions, but I'm pretty sure that the two screws we're going for are these two here. Yes, I was right. They are indeed the two screws at the back here. So um, I've got my little modeling screwdriver here. Now what I did with this, and actually it's something that I, I never used to do, but I, I do now all the time, is to magnetize the tip. It just makes this kind of job so much easier when you know that rather than uh, disappearing away down the rabbit hole and into the mechanism, that the uh, the screw will come out uh, when you <laughs> when you pull it out, it will come out with the screwdriver. So I've just popped that in there, the screw at the back. It's not a very big screw. There we go, that's one. Um, I'll just pop that to the side there. And then on the other side, the second screw. Now, if we're to believe the instructions, having removed the cab there and having removed these screws, yep, that's the final one there. That should be it. So uh, fingers crossed, uh, just 
let's get into the rest of it. So yes, having released the, the two screws, we just need to take the body off. Uh, now this one I've just, it was a wee bit stiff to move, so I'm just uh, just working it backs and forwards very slightly. It's a good idea when you're doing this to not only wash your hands first, take grease off, but to cut your fingernails too. Um, mine could probably do with a wee bit of a trim, but um, just to, to cut down on the potential for uh, marking the, the paintwork or leaving grease and so on on it. So just anyway, very carefully slide the body off there. There we go, excellent. And that has revealed to us the, the inner workings of the uh, of the Loco. It's a very, very condensed and compact uh, design that Helgen have got here. But right in the middle there, we can see the six pin blanking plate and there's not very much room at all there for things to fit in. Um, but uh, yeah, it's tiny. But anyway, there should hopefully, fingers crossed, be enough room for the decoder that I've got. So just before I uh, jump on to installing the, the decoder, I thought I would just um, just quickly look at what we've got in the side here. Um, so I mentioned just a second ago that it, it's pretty tight and it, it is a really pretty tight fit. Um, we've got the, the blanking plug here, which has just got a couple of diodes and the pins. And we've got the PCB here, and then we've got a wee bit of a rat's nest of, of wires. And we've got the, the black and red, which are the feeds coming up from the bogies, and then we've got the orange and the grey, which are the feeds to the motors. And um, what I forgot to say earlier on was when I was talking about you know, lighting and so on, I had been thinking about putting in a cab light. Uh, but one of the nice things about this particular model is that it does actually come with uh, marker lights uh, fitted in, which is quite something, and I should probably have pointed them out earlier actually. Um, but the, the LEDs for the, the marker lights are just down here, which is sort of just above the buffer beam, uh, and the, the same on the other side. Um, they are, let's see, where are they? Quite small. Um, oh yeah, sorry, they're, they're in the lights themselves, so they shine up up into them, which is a really nice touch because um, while I don't mind doing some fiddly wee jobs, fitting in um, these sorts of little lights is, is really finicky fiddly work. So it's a really nice touch that Helgen have got these installed. But what that means anyway is we have um, we have a common blue, which as I mentioned before, is something with six pin decoders is, is, is often not there and you have to use a couple of diodes and feeds from the track feed for that. But in this one we do actually have the common blue uh, and that runs with the, the wires for the, the rear lights and for the front lights there. So anyway, that's just a, a kind of quick run through there of the, uh, of, of the wiring and so on. Um, we'll delve in now into this proper, we'll take out the blanking plug uh, and we'll fit in the decoder. Now the one thing that I've just noticed that I would mention is that um, some of the soldering here is really shoddy and I, I don't know, let's see if we can get this on camera. Um, I don't know how well, it might just be out with the, oh no, there we go. So you'll probably be able to see there that the, the white uh, cable is really badly soldered onto that um, PCB. So I may have a look and see whether or not we can uh, we can get that improved, that joint. Although sometimes if it's hanging on well enough, even though it's a bit of a ropey joint, it's sometimes better just to leave it. But anyway, I'll carefully pull these wires out to the side and we'll get into it. Um, one thing just before I do that to mention is it's not actually uh, screwed or fixed down. So the PCB itself, you can just very carefully ease it up um, and careful, particularly with the dodgy soldering, not to rip the wires out, but just to, to very carefully ease it out of the, um, of the wee uh, depression here. And that will now allow us to, to get in and get that plug out. Okay, so one of the things which is quite useful for easing out PCBs are a, a set of tweezers. Um, I can't actually find my really thin tipped ones, but these ones with the, the rubber PVC outer will do. So that will just help us to lift that out and hold that there while we carefully look at this wiring here and ease it out. There we go. I think that's probably enough. Um, for what for what I need to, to get it out to that extent. Now some people have actually installed DCC sound into these um, and uh, the installations are, are well they're, they're a bit of a challenge. I think the speaker normally goes in the cab floor and a, a lock sound micro or whatever can go in the cab, uh, cab ceiling but um, I'm not going to do that with this particular shunter. I'm just going to get the chip in. And speaking of the chip, let's have a look at what we've got. 
and here is the chip in all of its glory. Um, some of you might recognise this as the chip that I tried to fit into the Andrew Barclay 040 Steam Loco um, a few videos ago. Uh, that didn't fit in that particular Loco um, and I was going to send it back and then I saw that this one um, and a few others actually that I was thinking about getting needed six pin chips. I thought I'd hang on to it and just as well I did. Now the one thing that I'd mention is that um, this is going to be a really tight fit and I may need to shave or file off a little bit of the PCB um, and also um, some of the, the insulation around the, the decoder to get it fitting in. But um, I might not, may have to, we'll just have to see when I get to the next stage. But anyway, I'll take this out of the packaging and then we'll look at getting it fitted in. Okay, so uh, that's the chip out of the packaging. It's a pretty small chip, but actually when you see it in comparison to this, it's not that small. Anyway, I've just done a quick um, sort of lining up and it will just fit but it does mean that this dodgy solder joint is going to be pushed quite hard up against the, the end of the containment area um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty tight and there's a possibility I think it could get quite close to the metal chassis. So what I'm going to do is put just a wee bit of uh, extra capped on tape just around the back here in the cable, so the wires rather, uh, just to, to insulate that a bit further. Um, and uh, also I've just removed this little bit of tape here just a little bit just to enable the, the cables, the wires to move down a little. It's all very tight um, but it will just about fit. So what I'm going to do now anyway is uh, is to remove the, the blanking plug that's, that's, that's in there already. Um, first of all I'm going to observe which way around it is just so that I, I know which way around to put the decoder back in. Um, the decoder, let's just get that here, will fit in the same way. So in this particular one, it is, there we are, it's like that. So that's pin one at this end, pin one at this end, so it will go in like this. So let's get the, uh, let's get this out, just ease it out. It's stuck in quite firmly this one. Uh, there we go. So I'll take that out and just check again. Pin one. So pin one in this this one here. If we can see like that. Line it up. And push it all the way home. I need something a wee bit stronger just to hold that in there. There we go. And we need to make sure it's as far in as possible because we're going to need every every single little <laughs> so, uh, millimetre or a fraction of millimetre space. So that's it in now. What I'm going to do is find a little bit of capped on tape just to, to pop at this end just to make sure that everything's properly insulated and then I'll seat it back in again. So um, I was just cracking on there and I thought I'd got away with it and that this would fit in but actually it's just a fraction too tight once this is in place. So I've taken it out again um, and I have trimmed away about a millimetre of the, the insulating material off the back of the decoder um, and looking at the, the back of the decoder here um, I am just free by about, oh, I don't know, a quarter of a millimetre um, to, to file it down. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to file this, this decoder down by about a quarter of a millimetre, so a, a tiny little amount, and that should be just enough to get it fitting in without pushing too hard. It did a squeeze fit in, but it was literally an absolute squeeze, and I wasn't too comfortable with the, the pressure that would be applied to, to the very end of the PCB here and the solder joint. So that's what I'm gonna do anyway. I'll just get a little bit of sandpaper. You could use a file as well if you want, just to take a tiny little bit off, and then I'll fit it back in, and then hopefully that time we'll get it uh, sitting snugly. Okay, so I've just very carefully filed back about as far as I dare. Now on this particular chip, um, there's a range of solder tabs, some of which have been soldered and others haven't. Um, now you just need to be incredibly careful when you're doing this that you, you don't short anything out and you don't remove anything that's vital. But uh, I've gone about as far as I can on this one and I think I'm okay. Now what I've also then done is just put a, a quick wrap of uh, capped on tape around the bits that I have uh, that I've um, um, sanded back and I've just put uh, a layer of it as well just in here just to be doubly sure. The reason I've done that is one of the tabs here is now right at the edge um, so there is a potential if something's butted up against it that it could short. So, um, But covering it with the cap on tape it'll be fine. So I'm just going to um, install this back in again into here. 
and then hopefully hopefully this time when I uh, ease it back in there we're going to have yeah that'll fit so um, I'm, I'm just going to do this off camera because there's a wee bit of chiggery pokery that's going to be required um, and I just want to concentrate on getting it right but uh, I'll, I'll do this and then I'll come back and just show you what, what I've done Okay, so it has just fitted in, <laughs> just fitted in a no more. It's a very, very tight fit, but just uh, shaving off that tiny little bit off the end has, has made it uh, seat in where it needs to. Um, now, you do have to be really careful when you're doing this that there's you know, nothing that's going to be shorting out, but I think I'm all good there. And putting the capped on tape in really does help as well. You need to make sure that these wires here around the back fit through the wee channel that's cut for them. Some of these may rise up a bit because there's not much give in the wires, but as long as they are uh, just low enough for where the, the kind of cab goes back on again, uh, we'll bring that into shot so that the cab goes back on again, should be fine. So anyway, that's it all, uh, all wired up absolutely fine. I'm going to pop the, the lid back on it again now, get the cab back on, get everything screwed in together uh, and uh, see how we, how we get on. So that is the uh, front part of the body back on and I've screwed the screws back in. Uh, one thing just to mention when you're doing that is um, it's, it's very easy to trap the wires on top of uh, on top of the body or between the chassis and the body. Um, so there's some tiny little channels at the front there so make sure they're sitting in there comfortably. Um, also there's some detailing on the front, the lighting tubes and so on. So just do be careful as you're, you're screwing that back in but it's, uh, it's not too bad. The one thing which is a little bit irritating I've just noticed here on the top is that the sellotape that they used in the factory to hold the, the wires down is that sellotape that goes really gunky and sticky and despite my, my best efforts um, there has been a bit of residue that's got stuck on here just from my fingers so I think the kind of lesson there is uh, once you've touched that cheap rubbish sellotape that they use give your hands a quick wash or something just to, to get that off but um, I'm sure it'll come off. Anyway so the, the next uh, part is uh, the cab replacement. Um, I, I'm going to put a driver in here uh, and at that time I might actually put a, a cab light in as well although I do actually think, oh look at this, actually now that I've said all that I actually think there might well be a cab light but I think there is a cab light in here that I missed. Um, it looks to me like there's a little bit of fibre optic or something tubing that's taking a light up. So we'll we'll see. Um, but anyway, the cab removal is, is really easy to do. So um, I'll take this off and once I've got a suitable driver, um, I shall pop him into place. But uh, once we've got this back on and test it on the track, we'll see if there is indeed a cab light in this already. And if there is, well, that'll be a pleasant surprise. So um, I'll just uh, get this and slowly ease this back on into position. That's it there. There we go. I don't want to push too hard because it is a really delicate one, but uh, that's just, those front ones just need to click in. There we go. But do do that gently because all of this is really very thin. It's nice prototypical, but uh, that also means it's quite delicate. So anyway, there we have it. That's it all back together again. Um, and I'm just going to get the test track out now, have a quick look just to make sure everything is as expected. Great, so we've got it on the test track, on the rolling road rather, so let's give it a wee whiz. Excellent. So the, the rolling road, this one has a tendency to wobble, but uh, the actual loco itself is okay. That's fine, we'll go in the reverse. And that's working fine as well. We bend in these handrails. So. It's okay. We're back back in the right position now with the handrails. And um, so one thing I've noticed here is that there there is the light here. Now I don't know how well this is gonna it's gonna show up. Let's maybe turn this around just slightly. Yeah, there we can see on this side. So you can see the. Uh, just down on this side here, we've got the marker light, so that's it uh, we're in, in reverse going forward. If we then change direction, you'll see it's switched over to the red marker light. And then if we spin this round, so you can see the front here. 
There we go. So we have the forward marker light here, and then in reverse. Oh, no, other way round, other way round, and then we've got the, the reverse marker light here as well. So the marker lights uh, seem to be working absolutely fine. They're a really nice little touch. Um, I think there is a light in the cab, but I honestly haven't worked out how to switch it on. And I don't know if it's maybe this decoder or not. So before I wrap up the video, I'm going to go and have a quick look at the instruction booklets and see if we can get to the bottom of that. But if there is a cab light, it'll be a lovely detail. Okay, so the very final thing that I want to do in the video is uh, just have a look at the, uh, the couplings. So the way it comes in the box, there's no couplings on it uh, and the, uh, the actual pockets and end pockets are hidden behind some little uh, shrouds here in the buffer beam. And uh, now I'm not going to put a coupling on the front of this one, um, but I think I'm going to leave that nicely detailed, but I'm going to put one in the back so it can haul. Um, so the way that these work um, is that there's just this little infill plug here um, and it just pops out fairly easily. There we go. Now be careful if you are doing this with a screwdriver so you don't mark the paint, but this one pops out really pretty easily. Uh, and that reveals the NEM pocket on the end. So what I'm going to do is get one of my KD couplers. I don't have any to hand just now, but I'll pop that in. It's at the right height for KD and that'll be absolutely magic. If you're using tension lock couplers, it's all the right height as well for the standard tension lock, so you're all good to go. So anyway, I'll uh, pop this down and uh, pack this up so we don't lose it and then we'll have one final look at it before we wrap up. Okay, so there you have it. A quick overview of the uh, the Helogen Class 05 shunter. Um, a quick look under the bonnet and then a fairly quick install as well of the DCC chip. Um, it wasn't as hard as I actually thought it might be and uh, it wasn't as hard as some supposedly easier installs I've had in the past but uh, all of that aside it's a lovely little model. It's a few years old now but uh, spectacularly detailed for what it is, runs really nicely, it's got a good weight and a good quality feel to it so it's something that I'm really happy now to have in my collection and my fleet and I'm sure anybody out there who's interested in diesels um, would, uh, would do worse anyway than having one of their fleet as well. So that's it for now. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you've got any comments, queries or questions, please leave them below in the, the comments section. If you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe um, and uh, I'll be back along soon with uh, another video, um, possibly a layout update, um, but we'll see how we get on. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Cheerio for now. Bye-bye.